right, everybody. I'm finally back. Uh, I had a house fire in October, and that kind of set me back a lot. Uh, we just moved in a couple weeks ago, and I finally got everything set back up, built another computer, and mm, ready to get back to it. So I've recently been in a debate with an individual who goes by the name Devil Advocates Debate Club. We began our conversation over the idea that there is no such thing as free will. I started to use some philosophical terms that he wasn't familiar with, which has led us down a terrible rabbit hole. So, just like I advocate for us explaining our definitions of terms, in which he in bad faith began to take it to the extreme and pretentiously say, let's begin with the letter A, I will define these terms as they are put forth in the, Stan in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. The terms are super complex and really need a deep dive into them in order to understand how they differentiate from each other. Fatalism Fatalism in philosophical terms is generally used to refer to the view that we are powerless to do anything other than what we actually do. In admittance of my ignorance, there are many ways to explain fatalism. Logical fatalism, theological fatalism, and causal de determinism, which is no longer considered fatalism. Logical fatalism. This is a complex argument, but I'll do my best to explain it. Logical fatalism is generally viewed as that no acts are free because before they were performed, it was already true that they would be performed. Aristotle put it forth with this argument. Suppose that 1. P is true or P is false, and 2. Not P is true or not P is false. Then P is true or not P is true. Now suppose that in 1900 one person says that a sea battle will take place on December 1st, 2100, and another says that a sea battle will not take place on December 1st, 2100 then either what the first person says is true or what the second person says is true. But in that case, either it is necessarily necessary in 1900 that a sea battle takes place on December 1st, 2100, or it is necessary in 1900 that one does not take place. But the date of the predictions is irrelevant, and it is irrelevant whether any prediction is actually made at all. So it is necessary at all times that a sea battle takes place on December 1st, 2100, or that a sea battle does not take place on December 1st, 2100. But the argument can, can evidently be generalized. So everything that happens, happens of necessity. First of all, we need to be clear about what is meant by necessity here. What is at issue here is not logical necessity. It is rather inevitability. When the occurrence of the sea battle on December 1st, 2100 is said to be necessary at a certain date, what is meant is that the date is that date nothing can prevent a sea battle from taking place on December 1st, 2100. In particular, no one has the power to prevent it. Now, Aristotle accepts that what is necessarily is when it is, and what is not necessarily is not when it is not. So, he accepts that if a sea battle is actually taking place on December 1st, 2100, then on December 1st, 2100, it is, in this sense, taking place of necessity. Nothing can then stop it happening because it is happening. What this argument appears to establish, however, is that if a seed battle takes place on December 1st, 2100, not only is it necessary then that a seed battle takes place on December 1st, 2100, but it was always necessary. No one could have ever prevented it. And the same applies to everything that can happen. So in particular, no one ever has the power to do anything other than what they actually do. Logical fatalism. This is the point that I was arguing from. Logical fatalism is a new concept for me. Even being introduced to the concept, I still do not subscribe to it. However, theological fatalism puts forth that God knows not only what actual people will freely do in the future, but what each possible free creature 
would have freely done in each set of possible circumstances, if fully specific, and that he had this knowledge at the time of creation. From this perspective, God knows exactly everything that an individual do in their free choices. God has knowledge so complete that it can see the story of the individual before it has been written. God can intervene and change one's fate using this knowledge, but that is up to God. This idea needs a creator to be inserted in order for it to make sense. God created the individual, and in many religions, this God is omniscient. Predeterminism. Now, this is another concept that devil's advocate conflates. Predeterminism or predestination. The concept of these ideas is that all events are decided upon ahead of time. So take theological determinism and add that God uses his knowledge to write that story before the, before the individual is even alive. Your fate is predetermined by a source outside. The term predeterminism suggests not just a determining of all events, but that prior and deliberately conscious determining of all events, therefore done presumably by a conscious being. Due to this, predeterminism and the similar term predetermination are easily and often confused or associated with ideas ranging, for instance, from the physicalist and often scientific notion of causal determinism to even theological and often religious notion of predestination. Predeterminism generally, generally refers to a conscious entity controlling the causality of events before they occur. On to the big baddie itself, determinism. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, causal determinism is, roughly speaking, the idea that every event is necessitated by antecedent events and conditions together with the laws of nature. Determinism is deeply connected with our understanding of the physical sciences and their explanatory ambitions, on the one hand, with our views about human free action on the other. In both of these general areas, there is no argument over whether determinism is true, or even whether it can be known true or false, and what the import for human agency would be in either case. The term itself is imprecisely defined. This gives the devil this gives devil's advocate a problem since he has to start with a dictionary definition. The loose and nearly all-encompassing definition for determinism is the world is governed by or is under the sway of determinism if and only if, given a specified way of things are at a time t, the way things go, therefore after, is fixed as a matter of natural law. Why the Devil's Advocate is Confused Within the Stanford article on determinism, a couple paragraphs is dedicated to laying why people often confuse fate and predictability with determinism. This is what aggravates me the most about our conversation. A basic reading would have given the information as to why he was wrong. However, I have to make an entire video holding his hand through philosophy 101 terminology, but whatever. According to the Stanford Encyclopedia, fatalism is the thesis that all events, or in some versions at least some events, are destined to occur no matter what we do. The source of the guarantee that those events will happen is located in the will of the gods, or their divine foreknowledge, or some intrinsic theological aspect of the universe, rather than in the unfolding events under the sway of natural laws or cause-effect relations. Fatalism is therefore clearly separable from determinism, at least to the extent that one can disentangle mystical forces and God's wills and foreknowledge about specific matters from the notion of natural causal law. Not every metaphysical picture makes this disentanglement possible, of course, but as a general matter, we can imagine that certain things are fated to happen, without this being the result of deterministic natural laws alone, and we can imagine the world being governed by deterministic laws without anything at all being fated to occur, perhaps because there are no gods, nor mystical theological forces deserving the titles fate or destiny, and in particular, no intentional determination of the 
initial conditions of the world. In a looser sense, however, it is true that under the assumption of determinism, one might say that given the way things have gone in the past, all future events that will in fact happen are already destined to occur. I then showed him a video of Sam Harris explaining fate as, if you just lied in your bed for your entire life, fate would just happen to you without your doing. Fate takes away the consciousness and the illusion of our minds making decisions. In the explanation of Aristotle's ship battle, whether or not it happened is fate. Nothing could have stopped or prevented it from happening. Even if you changed the laws of the universe, it was fated to happen. How is this different from determinism? Let's say we knew to some degree that a sea battle was going to happen. We could take a look at how to prevent the sea battle from ever happening by changing the antecedent factors. What if the sea battle happened because the Archduke was assassinated? Well, what if we stopped the assassination? Would that sea battle still happen? Under fatalism, yes, but under determinism, no, because we changed the antecedents. Whether or not that changes free will is an entirely different argument. If the devil's advocate still doesn't understand the difference, then I must confess that it is not within my power to help him understand. However, on to something else we discussed. In our conversation, I mentioned that dictionary terms are not always the best starting point. He believes, he believes that they are because they provide a common framework for communication. He then asked me what my solution was then, and I replied that we should ask the other person what they mean by their words. This was taken as every word, and he began by taking it to the extreme by asking me to define the letter A and then B, and so on. This tactic not only shows his ignorance, but his failure to understand descriptive and prescriptive grammar. I like to give my opponents the benefit of the doubt, and... I choose to have them define words that I know have loaded and convoluted meanings in philosophy and everyday language. This allows us to reach true common ground and understanding between the two. By asking, I am trying to understand how you got to your beliefs. I don't care about dictionary terms at this point because most of us already know the dictionary definition. I am more concerned at how the individual interprets the word through their perspective. Now, he talks about me saying that I view language subjectively, which isn't the case at all. There are many words in the dictionary that I will take at face value and do not need to ask the person using the words to define them further. Words are really just ideological concepts put into a series of sounds to convey meaning. When we talk about incredibly complex ideas that are actually not defined concretely, I would ask for more clarification on those words. Words like truth, love, justice, courage, equality, reality, etc. These words are loaded with vast amounts of knowledge behind them. No dictionary describes these words accurately, accurately and to say that is possible is intellectually dishonest. We are still debating what the concept of free will even entails to this day. It's not a cut and dry definition. This is similar to the argument of forms put forth by Plato. When somebody says the word tree, we have this general idea of what a tree looks like in our mind. Now to the other person, is this the same general idea? If I said I planted a tree in my backyard, how do you know any real descriptive elements of that tree because of that sentence? More than likely, you have an idea of a sapling or a small tree. But what if I planted a full grown tree and then said I proceeded to climb it? If you had thought it was a sapling, the idea of climbing it would be absurd. Or, if I said, I laid under it for shade, one would think how a sapling offers enough shade to lay under. These misconceptions can lead to faulty premises and ideas in the short-term and long-term conversation. Beyond that, if I said tree, what kind of tree do you automatically visualize? A pine tree or a maple tree? A real tree, a cartoon tree, or a tree that visually organizes information? Is it a tree with green leaves or is it one that is turning colors? How big is that tree? Is it a sapling? Is it a tree that has fruit or flowers? Now, some of these things can be answered through context, but when we're trying to build upon actual philosophical ideas, these need to be known in order to make sure we have a complete understanding between each other. No one wants to build an argument or a philosophy upon a bad premise. Then all the fruit of the conversation becomes null and meaningless. This is what I meant by defining words. 
Lewis wants to try to win this argument, and by doing so, he builds faulty premises such as the ones he presented in this video down below. I am more concerned with building ideas and concepts, not trying to win a debate. Definitions change as our knowledge becomes more complete and our ability to describe concepts become more defined. This is where I come from. I am not interested in definitions set out by dictionaries. Any layman can argue from those and it's quite boring to say the least. I am interested in building real connections with people so we can truly understand each other. Children in learning English need dictionaries. Adults wanting to know more look at the entirety of the word in its ideological conception. And for the stone philosopher's fallacy, whatever, man. Hopefully you guys liked this video and my reply and you learned a little bit about determinism, fatalism, and all of that other stuff. Uh, if you liked the video, give me a like. If not, give me a thumbs down. Share it. Subscribe. Make sure you hit the bell button. And uh, I think my next video is already done. I'm going to do it on common sense. Uh, it should be interesting. So until next time, be safe.